Uh, right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now for something uh, a little bit different. Uh, so hopefully we can all appreciate that sexual selection is one of the fundamental driving forces behind evolution. So the classic examples we like to use are the peacock train or stag's antlers. These features um, quite often in males, uh, which are useful in you know, attracting a mate or winning a mate. Uh, but increasingly, we recognize that actually sexual selection uh, carries on during the actual act of copulation as well. Uh, and especially in species where females are mating with multiple males, actually through the process of sperm competition as well. So uh, quite often, if we look across you know, any one given group, uh, genital structures are frequently uh, one of the most morphologically diverse and quite often the, the fastest evolving structures as well. So even within the vertebrates that we're interested in talking about today, we see you know, these bizarre structures and shark claspers and hemipenes, the classic you know, duck corkscrew penis and also the vagina as well. Uh, but in particular, I'm interested uh, today in talking about the mammalian baculum. Uh, so if you're not aware, the baculum is the penis bone in mammals. It occurs in the, the glans penis, or we'd say the head of the penis. Uh, and in some species, it's fairly substantial in size, like this uh, male polecat. Uh, obviously, in others, like uh, in the great apes, it gets down to the you know, size of a grain of rice. Obviously, in humans, uh, we've lost it entirely. Uh, but they don't only differ in their size as well. Even if we remove the effect of size, they're incredibly uh, diverse in their shape as well. So this is just a, a small sample uh, of some of the modern carnivores. So uh, given how uh, charismatic they are, it's unsurprising that we like to, to speculate about their possible function. Uh, first of all, I should get the caveat in that I think it's unlikely that we're going to find one kind of single silver bullet uh, function for, for all of mammalian bacula. Uh, particularly in light of uh, the study came out last year uh, where they did a, a phylogenetic reconstruction of just presence, absence of the baculum. And those authors suggested that perhaps the, the structure isn't even homologous across mammals. Perhaps it's appeared independently several times. Uh, with those in mind, uh, we do still speculate about what the baculum might be doing. Uh, perhaps it actually helps in the initial act of intromission, uh, particularly in species that are characterized by very strong sexual size dimorphism. Uh, it might help with prolonged copulation, so particularly in some of the, the mustelids, they'll, they'll breed for a very extended period of time. Perhaps having that rigid support structure there removes some of the, the physiological costs of effectively maintaining an erection for that long. Uh, or it could be in some of the groups that are characterized by induced ovulation. The females need to be, to be stimulated, triggered to ovulate. Perhaps the baculum is playing a function there. Um, so across my fellowship more broadly, I'm collecting lots of anatomical data on, on all of the mammals, uh, but I'm going to talk today about the carnivores in particular. Uh, they're a, a nice little case study uh, because we are at least fairly confident that the baculum has only evolved once in the carnivores. Uh, it has then subsequently been lost in things like the hyena and the binturong. Uh, so it ranges from just being, being absent entirely to being you know, fairly prodigious in size if you look at the walrus. Uh, they have interesting mating systems, so again, ranging from being fairly solitary to living in big harems. Uh, some of the females are spontaneous, others are uh, induced to ovulate, and also their actual mating behavior is, is very different. So in the cats, they engage in very short uh, bursts of copulation, less than 60 seconds. Uh, in some of the mustelids, as I say, they can mate for over three hours. Um, so... Uh, one of the hypotheses that I'm interested in testing, before I actually get to the, the, um, the function of the baculum and to the biomechanics of it, first of all, I think we need to understand uh, whether or not um, actually the strength of post copulatory sexual selection is indeed acting on the shape of the baculum. So we understand it probably is acting on the size of the baculum. We have good evidence for that. But no one has really tried to study the, the shape of the, at least the carnivore baculum in any great detail. Um, probably because of some of the difficulties that I'll talk about in terms of the methods. Uh, so first of all, I, I would hypothesize that um, species that are subject to stronger post copulatory sexual selection are going to have more complex shaped baculum. And in particular, if we think that the tip is being involved in either helping to ensure sperm delivery or removing previous male sperm or stimulating the female, perhaps the tip will be more complex, perhaps it will be evolving faster. Uh, so both of my hypotheses involve uh, shape. Uh, coming into this project, I, I naively uh, assumed that I would be answering these kind of questions uh, using geometric morphometrics. Uh, the problem is, well, one of the really nice things about mammalian bacula, the interesting thing is they are so diverse in shape, uh, you know, very closely related species, have very different shaped baculum. 
That does mean it's then a nightmare for finding any uh, homologous landmark points. Um, so studies looking at intraspecific variation, looking at house mice, have used a very uh, automated semi-landmarking approach. Uh, we've tried to implement some of these. It just doesn't work across this, this very broad sample that I have. Uh, also, uh, it, particularly in the invertebrate literature, uh, people tend to use analysis, things like uh, elliptical Fourier analysis in 2D, or this uh, 3D implementation uh, called spherical harmonics. And again, we have tried to implement this, but I'm not happy with it working in a, in a kind of consistent fashion at the moment. So we've ended up kind of developing our own method for at least giving us a, a rough metric of shape complexity in the mammal baculum. Uh, so first of all, uh, it starts off with a CT data set, a micro CT, so scanning things from the size of the walrus baculum all the way down to very small mustelids, meerkats, that kind of thing. We then take the CT data set, uh, threshold it in a fairly uh, automated fashion based on its, its grayscale histogram. You end up with a binarized image, which we then turn into a point cloud. Uh, and then we are fitting shapes to these point clouds. So if any of you have heard me in the past uh, talk about mass estimation in the fossil record, you've probably heard me bang on about putting convex holes around things. Uh, so in 2D, if you have a simple shape like this, we can fit a convex hole to it. And this is a, a minimum fit um, of convex polygon around a set of points. Uh, however, a convex hull is just one shape out of a, a family of broader shapes called alpha shapes. Uh, and we can effectively change the, the refinement coefficient of these shapes to fit increasingly more um, contoured, uh, shrink wrap shaped around a point cloud. So this is just by changing this value of the alpha coefficient. So if we do this in 2D, we can then apply it in 3D to our baculum. So these are uh, three different species of carnivores. We've fitted convex holes around their point clouds. We're then refining that value of alpha, so we're effectively getting more and more refined meshes fitted around the point cloud data. Um, so we are then comparing the, the volume of these unusual shapes that we're fitting to what we'll say is the true volume that we take from the actual CT data. And then we're basically interested in the point at which we can match the, the volume from these alpha shapes to the actual volume of bone that we estimated from the CT scan. And we'll call that the, the optimal value of alpha. So you can see in the middle, that's a fairly simple or intuitively what we'd say is a simple looking baculum from a bear. Uh, and as soon as we start refining the, the convex hull, very quickly uh, our mesh volume converges on that from the CT. So we'd say that's a fairly simple shape. Whereas if you look in red at the mustelid, it's very hooked end. We have to refine this value of alpha quite a lot from our convex hull before that volume agrees with what we had uh, from the CT data set. So we get this value of alpha, which is, as I say, this broad metric of complexity or how much it differs from being a simple straight beam. Uh, and if we plot that on a phylogeny, reassuringly, there is a very strong phylogenetic signal, as we'd hoped there'd be. Um, the species, like the mustelids uh, and the carnivores, uh, have uh, very high values of alpha. We see in red. Uh, the species that we'd expect to have very simple baculum, like the pinnipeds and the bears, they fall out as having uh, very low values of alpha. That's reassuring. It also emphasizes the point that we need to do all of our subsequent analyses uh, with uh, phylogenetic corrections in mind. Um, so very quickly, some initial results having done this. We've taken this value of alpha, this, this metric of how complex uh, the, the mammal baculum is, and we've effectively regressed it against a, a metric of relative testes size. Uh, and in the, the sexual selection literature, we tend to use relative testes size as a metric of how strong this post-copulatory sexual selection is. Uh, and we do find a positive correlation, so those species that are subject to stronger post copulatory sexual selection do have a more uh, complex baculum uh, in terms of this alpha value. Uh, so putting that simply, these uh, species with this very simple looking baculum, like this is a bear, tend to have uh, smaller relative testes size, whereas those species with more complex shaped baculum, like the canids, uh, have relatively larger testes. Uh, we have then uh, split up the baculum into uh, regions, like the tip, the mid shaft, and the base, and then rerun this alpha analysis uh, as we would kind of expect, we find that the tip is absolutely more complex uh, in terms of alpha. We also see quite high values in the base as well, which is, again, as we'd expect, that it has some interesting uh, attachment sites at the base. But then perhaps most interestingly, if we use uh, this is some code by Dean Adams to calculate the, the Brownian rate parameters, we can basically test if these various uh, regions of the baculum are evolving faster or evolving at different rates. Um, 
And what we actually find, uh, which is counter to what I initially expected, uh, is that the mid shaft seems to be uh, evolving faster in terms of this value of alpha. Uh, everyone would assume that it would be the tip just because they have such uh, interesting, uh, elaborate shapes. Um, if I were to speculate as to why we're getting this particularly high value of alpha in the mid shaft, <coughs> Uh, it may be driven by the uh, occurrence of a urethral groove. So this is uh, on the ventral side of the baculum. It's a very distinct groove in, in the canids and the mustelids uh, that the urethra, uh, urethra sits in. Uh, and arguably, that may play a role in protecting the urethra to make sure sperm can be delivered. Also in the mid shaft, we see the occurrence of uh, attachment sites for the, the bulbous glandus, which uh, in dogs is this extra structure, which is why they get uh, tied together at the end of mating. Uh, so to summarize, um, we basically set out to test whether or not the shape complexity of the carnivore baculum uh, is indeed uh, correlated to the strength of post copulatory sexual selection. It does seem uh, that it is. Uh, we've had to develop this new technique using alpha shapes to be able to, to test that. Uh, in absolute terms, the tip and the base do seem to be evolving uh, the quickest. Uh, sorry, they do seem to have absolutely higher values of complexity, but interestingly, at the moment, it seems like the mid shaft is actually evolving the fastest. This is quite nice because it ties in with uh, results that um, colleagues have found working on bat penises. So here they have uh, basically a, a flaccid bat, bat penis, and then they have given it an erection with uh, ethanol, fixed it, stained it in iodine, scanned it again. Uh, and they speculate that uh, this uh, is the urethra in purple here, that the, that the baculum is indeed protecting uh, that urethra to make sure sperm can be delivered. So that's something that we see in bats as well. Uh, so with that, I will thank my collaborators and I will take some questions.